Mirth or morning? Mirth or morning? You might be surprised what the Bible says about this. My name is Al Persaud, and we're talking about something a little out of the ordinary. We've been on the doctrine of God, but I'm just going to take a break here because we've got somebody uh, uh, speaking Sunday morning today in our church, so I'm going to fill in a little gap here and uh, with a great topic. Is the What's better? Is it better to be in the house of uh, celebration and uh, joy and, and uh, mirth? That's the word, celebration, joy, being merry. Or to be in the house of mourning? the house of reflection, which is better? Well, let's have a look at what the scripture says. First of all, the, uh, uh, the scripture we're gonna look at is from the book of Ecclesiastes. The writer in the, book, in the book of Ecclesiastes was not in his best place. He was uh, looking at his own life. Possibly this is King Solomon, more than likely it is King Solomon. But he makes some very sage comments, some wonderful comments that do help us to keep our lives in perspective. And I think we should have a look at these. So we're going to pop into the book of Ecclesiastes, and it is chapter 7. This is a great book, by the way. Ecclesiastes, this is the book that talks about, that says there's a time to live and a time to die and a time to whatever. That's an Ecclesiastes. There's a lot of well frequent uh, quotes in our popular culture that come from the book of Ecclesiastes. Hey, let's pop into this Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Let's begin to read at verse 1. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, and the heart of the fools is in the house of mirth. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of, of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. With this also is vanity. Look at verse 5 again. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. So come, come with me to the house of mirth. And everybody is having a party, is partying and eating and drinking and carrying on. It's music in the background and it's all happening. Now, a lot of people want to live in the house of mirth all the time, in the house of feasting all the time. By the way, there's nothing wrong with feasting. There's nothing wrong with celebrating. There's nothing wrong with laughing and enjoying things, by the way. People who know me know I probably spend more time laughing than most people that you'll ever meet. There's a joy that comes from knowing God and being at peace with him. And hey, it's, it's well, those of you who've been Christians for years, I think you understand what I'm talking about. Anyways, moving along. The problem that happens with a lot of, a lot of people is, that's not good English. A lot of people spend too much time in the house of mirth and they always want to celebrate, they always want to do that, and they never want to be in the house of mourning or the house of reflection. I'd like to just uh, uh, pop back into that last verse I read one more time. It's better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. What is the house of mourning? It's that time of reflection. It's that quiet time where you put, you put the screaming and the shouting and the noise aside and you spend time pondering. You look at being a better you. Christians know to look at the scriptures as a mirror, as the scriptures reflect who we really are. I can't be a better you. I can be a better me. I can make it a goal to be a better you, but I can make it a goal my goal to be better than I was yesterday. To be better in what way? Well, as a believer, to walk closer to God, to sin less, to have a cleaner conscience, to know him better, to be more filled with his spirit, to be more filled with joy. You might say, well, I'm not even a believer. Does this even matter? Well, let me challenge you. Would you rather be worse than you were yesterday or better than you were yesterday? What kind of a foundation would you like to live on? Yeah, I'd like to look back and say, this is what happened in the past, this is where I am today. You don't get there by constantly celebrating. You have to spend some time looking at what sort of person you are so that you can make a decision to take responsibility. 
one of the things that makes the Christian message unpalatable for some is that it is a message of taking responsibility. God does not let you off the hook. You have to take the responsibility that he has equipped you to take and learn to walk with him and learn to talk with him and along life's narrow way. There's an old Baptist hymn about that. He walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. It's a great hymn. But uh, you need to learn to do that. You need to learn to take responsibility and not blame the world for what's going on. Listen, folks, it is not up to the people around you to prepare the road for you. Hmm? No one should have to pave the jungle for you. No, it's to prepare you for the road. Because the road is tough and the road is difficult. Along the way, along the journey, people will hate you, especially if you want to accomplish something great. If you want to accomplish something that is great or that's different, be prepared. People will not like you. Usually because they're envious. Usually because they're jealous. Sometimes because you have to step in their place and you've got to take for yourself. You've got to hold on to something. I think you know what I'm talking about. What, do you want everybody to like you? Folks, if you want everybody to like you and agree with you, you will be only one thing in life and that is mediocre. Hmm. Everybody likes me, sorry. <laughs> mediocre, okay. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that you should be on the journey for everybody to hate you either. This is part of being in the house of mourning as well as being in the house of mirth. It's better to be in that place. What is the house of mourning? It's a place of self-reflection, using the scriptures, thinking deeply about who you are, thinking about who you were yesterday, and what you could be tomorrow. Asking yourself if you are taking the responsibility that God has given you faithfully and properly. The book of Proverbs was largely written by, the, by King Solomon. Hey, listen, you want a great read? Read the book of Proverbs, book of Ecclesiastes. Just keep reading them. They're great. They're just great. So much wonderful wisdom about how you should live. But in the book of Proverbs, but, shouldn't say but, in the book of Proverbs in chapter 24, the writer talks about going past the house of the sluggard, that is the lazy man. Let's have, pop in and see what he says. I passed by the field of a sluggard, I love that word, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense, and behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles, and the stone and its stone wall was broken down. Then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber, and want like an unarmed man. Whew. What do you think about that? You ever read that? That is one ripper of a passage. The writer's walking by the field of someone who's lazy, a sluggard. He notices that everything is overgrown. He notices that his fields are covered with thistles. He hasn't spent any time clearing his land, hasn't cleaned up. And what did he do? Did he say, look at that lazy man? Mm. No. It says, and I looked, he says, then I saw and considered it, and I looked and received instruction. I didn't judge the man necessarily. I looked at my own life. I looked at who I was. I received instruction. What was the instruction? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber, like an unarmed man. What's he saying? He's saying that it is work that people do that helps them to stay successful. This is really a passage about working hard. In fact, in that passage as well, read Proverbs 24. It says, go to the ant. Look at the ant. He doesn't have a leader. And look what he does. Look at what he accomplishes. It's talking about the fact that successful people work hard. The person who attends the house of mourning is someone who's going to take time to realize that he does not have much time. 
When you're in the house of mirth, all the partying and all the dancing and all the singing and all the shouting and all the drinking and all the eating, you don't have time to think about the time that you do not have. How many of you have heard this saying, you know, I watched this uh, program and that's an hour of my life I'm never getting back. It's kind of funny, I like it, but oh my. An hour of mirth is an hour of life that you may never get back. Now, I'm not saying spend all your time mourning, but I am saying spend some time thinking about those things that you have that you're not going to have forever. The Lord Jesus Christ told a number of parables. Most of those parables have to do with the transition from the old covenant age into the new covenant age in which we're living. Many of them though have broad applications for us in our general lives. This one is particular. I'm going to go to Luke chapter 12 and we're going to look at a parable that the Lord Jesus Christ told in response to a question. And it is along these lines. In fact, it's so tightly along these lines, it's really quite wonderful. Luke chapter 12, beginning to read at verse 13. Here we go. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of one's possessions. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have, be, you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Ooh, makes you just kind of shudder, doesn't it? What did the Lord call him? He said, fool. He said, your soul is required of you tonight. Let's come back to our opening passage today. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. We can see that this rich man who had built all of these barns was in the land of mirth. Uh, yes, eat, drink, and be merry. I'm just gonna build a big bunch of barns, I'm gonna store all my stuff and spend the rest of my life partying. Hey, I've heard this before. I'm here for a good time, not a long time. You ever heard people say that? Yeah. How is it then that when they get close to dying, they do everything they can to try to stay alive just a little bit longer? You've had your good times, haven't you? <laughs> no, people are desperately concerned about their mortality. When they're young, they're not so concerned because, oh well, I'll survive no matter what happens. But as they get a little bit older, it's like, mm, I'm very concerned about my mortality or my lack of it. What did this rich man do? He went to the house of mirth and did not reflect on the fact that he was indebted to God, that he had a spiritual life that had to be looked after. At one point, the Lord Jesus Christ says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? I'm now making this very, very personal to you, dear listener, to you, my friends. When you attend the house of mourning, that is the time of personal reflection, the first question to ask yourself is, am I right with God? If God were to say to me tonight, this night your soul is required of you, what would I have? I think we should go back and look at this, uh, at the words of God. Let's look at the parable itself. I think this is good again. One more time. What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. So what's the first thing that he is thinking to himself? And he said, I will do this. 
I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Do I need to say any more? The house of mirth is wonderful. The place of partying and the place of celebrating is wonderful. But it's not a place where you can look at yourself. It's not a place where you see the mirror. It's not a place where you can say, what if God required my soul of me tonight? The house of mirth is not a place where you can take some time to look at who you were yesterday so that you can be better today and possibly better again tomorrow. The house of mirth is not that kind of place. In yet another parable, the Lord talked about a man who built his house upon the sand. And when the winds came and the storm came, the sand uh, didn't help. It didn't support his house and it blew down. And there was another man who built his house upon the rock and that stayed. You know, that parable, I, I was tempted to use that parable here today. Think about the man who built his house upon the sand. It's fine, we live near sand. We live near that, near the coast. You could build your house there when there's no storm. It's all fine, you have a big party there. Great party, wonderful. Beautiful, balmy, sunny day and a sunny night. Gentle breeze, great. Why do you think he built his house upon the sand, not upon the rock? Maybe he sought the house of mirth. That's what we always learned as children that um, there he is partying with all his friends when the wind comes, blows the house away. <laughs> Maybe that's what he just wanted to do, get the house up so I can party. The essence of wisdom in the scriptures works this way, and it's not only in the scriptures. A wise person takes the time today to prepare for the future. You, you really know it. A wise person denies himself something now so that he can have something that lasts in the longer term. A foolish person has to have it now, has to have immediate gratification, doesn't think towards the future. The wise person says, well, I'm going to have a, 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 couple, uh, have a couple of chickens, I'm gonna lay eggs, and then we'll make more chickens, and more eggs, more chickens, more eggs. The foolish person says, eat the chickens now. Just eat the chickens now. I really think you know what I'm talking about. Ultimate wisdom is the knowledge of God. There is a future, and the future extends beyond the death of your body. Look at those words. Fool, tonight your soul is required of you. Look at the implication that's after that. There is something that happens after you die, and you want to be right with God. <sighs> I hope you enjoyed this. We're back onto the doctrine of the Trinity, the uh, house of mirth, the house of mourning. Well, we'll leave it behind for the minute, but we're going to come back to it in some other ways in the future. I hope that all is well with you. My name is Al Persson. You can contact me at pastor at mascot.church. Today's topic has been mirth or morning. God bless you. We will talk soon.